Hi, and welcome to the Yak. Tonight we're going to talk about our top five progressive rock keyboard players. So the role of a keyboard player in the band is to provide harmonic accompaniment to the melodic components of a song. This requires the player to have a thorough understanding of the music genre. They must be able to musically harmonize with other band members and be able to deliver great melodies and solos when required against a background of chords using textures and sound tones which suit the music. So, Tom. What's your first one? Okay, so at number five, I have Richard Wright. Richard Wright. So Richard or Rick uh, was a songwriter, singer, and main keyboardist for Pink Floyd. And I remember in my late teens listening to the album Wish You Were Here and the track Shine On You Crazy Diamond, um, part one and nine, and Welcome to the Machine, and thinking these sounds are just incredible, <laughs> and that I'd never heard anything like this before. And the keyboard parts perfectly contributed to the colour and atmosphere of the song, and I have never tired from hearing them. So they were simple, but perfect. And uh, Richard Wright also had a liking for jazz, so have a listen to the piano work on Sisyphus Parts 1 to 4, for example. He was a great player, and most significantly, he chose to write parts which perfectly suited the music. <laughs> uh, so just the right choice of notes and chords for ballads, um, Pink Floyd Wright wrote, um, rather than show his musical prowess. He also had a placid, introverted nature, which may have kept him from fighting for leadership <laughs> uh, between Waters and Gilmore. And tensions in the band did develop after the Wish You Were Here album, as writing contributions from Wright dropped off. And in the studio, he ended up spending more time helping arrange songs uh, written by Waters and Gilmore. And one of the problems was that he had a maturing drug habit at that mm. time, which reduced his overall input into the band. Mm. And he was actually sacked by uh, <laughs> Waters during the making of The Wall. But gradually, Wright cleaned himself up, and David Gilmore actually brought him back to the band as a session player in the 1987 uh, A Momentary Lapse of Reason album and tour. Uh, which we both saw yeah, great um, tour. here in Melbourne, and you know what a show that was! Yeah, it was a great show. So some of the f the signature keyboards he used were Farfisa and Hammond organs and the Kurtzwell synth. Yeah, I, I mean, famously with Richard Wright was um, when they were doing the wall just after he'd been sacked. Yeah. He actually made more money than the guys because he was on a wage. Um, so he had no um, loss of income. But uh, the other guys, of course, were paying for the huge show. So, That's right. but great keyboard player. Yeah. Yeah. Love his work. All right. So my number five right. is Mr. Martin Orford from oh, yes. IQ. IQ, yeah. Now, Martin Orford is best known for being a member of prog rock bands IQ and Jadis, yes. the former being one of my favourite prog bands of all time. His skill at tinkling the ivories is easily recognised when listening to any IQ song, and he can produce a strong, sweet melody seemingly at the drop of a hat. His work on IQ's The Seventh House is simply stunning in my opinion, and the title song of the same name is an outstanding composition with beautiful keys work. The piano part alone in that is worth the price of the album on its own. The very same album has the song Guiding Light, yeah, which yeah. quite simply I wish I'd written myself. Oh. It's a superb song. Um, he's released two solo albums on his own, and his second The Old Road is an outstanding piece of work that had a host of special guests, mm. including Steve Thorne, the sadly recently passed David Longdon of mm. Big Big Train fame, yeah. Dave O'Bell, John Mitchell and John Wetton. One of your favourite guys. That's right. Unfortunately, whilst being a superb album, it was also Martin's swan song. As sadly, he announced his retirement from the music business shortly afterwards, citing 
disillusionment with the industry and its pathway towards the future of the Spotify model of music virtually free. He wasn't wrong, as the difficulties facing today's musicians are practically insurmountable. And in saying all that, he's resurfaced as a member of Jadis and is currently playing live with them in the UK as this goes out. Yeah, so look, Martin offered. Um, certainly he has been a major figure in UK prog rock. Having been with IQ for, I think, over 25 years now. Yeah, something like that, yeah. And uh, with Jadis for, I think, 20 years. On so. and off with Jadis, yeah. yeah. So it is indeed unfortunate that the old road, as you mentioned, um, marked his departure uh, from music, but luckily offered, um, has left us with an impressive legacy. Mm, very impressive, yeah. Okay. So my number four now. And I'm going to pick Eddie Jobson <laughs> from UK. <laughs> now, I admire this guy so much, and I wouldn't use this term for many musicians. Okay. But in Eddie Jobson's case, I have to say the word prodigy. Ooh. Okay. Now, it's a term which has been mentioned uh, before by others um, many times before. Mm. And uh, Jobson came from a, a background heavily influenced by jazz rock. Uh, but fortunately, he recorded two genuine albums of prog rock yeah. um, with the, uh, the highly revered supergroup UK, which in my opinion are a significant input into the genre. And Jobson is an incredibly talented keyboard player. Uh, and also a violin player, yeah. and um, he has delivered on all levels in terms of uh, musical colour and melodic lines and solos, just perfect for prog rock. He played the Mini Moog, the uh, Hammond organ, and at that time the newly, newly released Analog CS80 <laughs> Yamaha synth with UK. Now the CS80 was also a big thing, weighing 82 kilos. <laughs> so it's not a live proposition for most artists, uh, but its sound is amazing, offering big, fat, analog sounds. So have a listen to the albums and you'll be impressed. And it is unfortunate that UK only recorded two studio albums. Uh, so look, anyway, that's my take on a big hero of mine, Eddie Jobson. A big hero. That's right. Um, now... Um, UK, very jazz orientated from, from what I remember. I'm not a huge fan of UK, but um, in saying that, uh, I mean, Eddie Jobson had his moments, very brief moments with a few bands, Tull, on the A album from memory. Yeah, and, yes, that's right. And plus the and, live tour. And the, oh, did he yeah, do the live tour? The live yeah. Tour, yeah. And um, I think he was in Yes for about all of 15 seconds, wasn't uh, he? A highly edited video. <laughs> <laughs> video clip, yes. I do remember that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, look, I know Eddie Jobson through, I think, his album Green. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I used to have that. I, I think I still have it. But um, yeah, great keyboard player. Mm. Great musician all around, yeah, actually, absolutely. Eddie Jobson. Yeah. So my number four is Mr. Um, Tony Banks. Tony Banks, uh, yes. Tony Banks from Genesis, of course. Yeah. Uh, being the keyboard player on one of my all-time favourite albums, Genesis Sell in England by The Pound, it would, of course, be criminal if I did not place him in my top five. Banks' true love of music started when his older brother introduced him to the modern music of Frankie Lane. Wonderful. <laughs> And for the next five to six years, he was, in his own words, music mad. At 13, he began piano lessons, which was a bit of a disaster, but was teaching himself modern composition by ear. A new teacher rekindled his love of classical music, and the rest, as they say, is history. Banks also taught himself guitar, but it's his keys work that is his main skill. I'm not going to dwell much on the Genesis story, as it's been well documented. Sure. Suffice to say, his body of work in the progressive and pop genres with that band speaks for itself. Hmm. They are the typical progressive rock band, and whilst they were not the first for me in those early years, they were the best, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. A major, if not the major songwriter in the Genesis camp, his six solo albums did not enjoy the same success as his band bandmates, but still demand a listen, as they are excellent albums in their own right. A very good keys player indeed. Yeah. Well, 
Tony Banks, good choice. Mm. Uh, yes, I certainly love his play. He is simply a completely iconic and amazing uh, player in the genre. Yeah. So at number three, now when you get to number three, well, there's probably not much in it, right? Okay, so <laughs> choices sort of could go either way a little bit. So at number three tonight, I have Keith Emerson. Keith Emerson. Okay. And I'm going to be a little self-indulgent here because I think we can all agree that Emerson, who is sadly no longer with us, was one of the best progressive rock keyboardists ever. Yeah. He was really a keyboard virtuoso with almost unparalleled technical ability. I've heard lots of live work of him with ELP and I've never heard him hit a wrong note. So the trio of Emerson, Lake and Palmer formed in 1970 and that's early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They could be considered to be one of the first ever progressive rock supergroups. Yeah. There is often a heavy jazz influence in Emerson's playing, but he could effortlessly move from uh, rock to jazz, uh, blues and classical to deliver a genuine fusion of styles. Also, not all the songs had vocals in them, so in these, Emerson's keyboard provided the melodies instead. In the occasional guitar solo by Lake, Emerson would take over the bass parts on the keyboard. And my personal favourite albums are Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Tarkas Trilogy and Brain Salad Surgery. Emerson was also a big mood pioneer and brought the keyboard sound to the fore. He was always on the search for bigger, grander sounds, mm -hmm. building a bigger and bigger fortress of keyboards around him on stage. So his signature Monster Moog was a massive modular system connected via a multitude of maybe, I don't know, a hundred patch cords. It was a monster. Okay? <laughs> and I wouldn't know how to connect any of those. Um, now get this, it weighed 250 kilos and stood three meters tall. That makes the, the Yamaha look like a toy, Yeah, it? that's right, just a baby. <laughs> Incidentally, five of these units were built in the 2014 to 2017 Moog Reissue series with a list price of $150,000 US each. Did you, did you buy one? I bought all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so as technology advanced, Emerson went on to play other keyboards, including Mini Moog, Yamaha GX1 and several models made by Korg and I remember seeing these advertisements for Korg back in the 1980s with Emerson playing them and to thinking just I want that keyboard I need it <laughs> it's going to make me play better that's right <laughs> so Emerson was also a theatrical performer mm. but his showmanship did not detract from the music um, it just added to the live experience. Mm. He would, for example, I'm sure you remember, yeah. uh, jump on top of his Hammond organ and battle with it. He would use knives to uh, wedge down some specific keys during solos. He would throw knives at the target fastened in front of his keyboard speaker yeah. and play the spinning piano. <laughs> Do you remember that? The high above the crowd spinning piano. He would be seven metres in the air yeah. before the grand piano would start to rotate end on end with Emerson sitting at it. And he wasn't even properly strapped in. <laughs> He was back in the old days. <laughs> and at least on one occasion, he broke his nose when the piano started spinning before he was ready for it. He wasn't even <laughs> strapped in. He used to hook his feet, didn't That's he? That's right, yeah. yeah. So look, I do admire him very, very much. And I remember learning his keyboard solo for Fanfare for the Common Man by ear when, when I was in my late teens. And I still like that solo today. Mm. To me, it never sounds boring. I love the sounds. I love what Emerson played. And I must admit, in preparing for this top five review, I hadn't listened to many ELP tracks, which I hadn't heard for ages, maybe some 15 years. Yeah. Uh, and I was just blown away and reminded at how good he was and how good ELP were. Uh, just a phenomenal band. Well... To be perfectly honest, ELP are probably one of my top five mm. bands. When I was a youngster, yeah. that was my first foray into progressive rock. A friend gave me um, a, the live album, the triple live oh, album, yes, Welcome yeah. Back My Friends. Yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. blown away. I'd never heard anything yeah. like that. And uh, it, it, it's just a fantastic band. Mm. Just finishing a European tour with Arena, my number three is the charismatic Clive Nolan. Huh? Notably, Clive is the keys player with Pendragon, the aforementioned arena, 
his shall we say pop progressive outfit Shadowland yes and the vocalist Tracy Hitchings collaboration Strangers on a Train he also has a partnership with Adam Wakeman which has released three albums to date he runs his own theatre company called Camora and on top of all this has produced a multitude of other bands albums at age 16, Clive achieved the accolade of becoming the youngest musician in England to gain a composition diploma from the London College of Music. He studied violin, cello mm -hmm. and viola, although his actual main study was composition, orchestration, musical arrangement and conducting. <laughs> so he's done a bit to say the least. <laughs> to say he's busy in the prog world would be a gross understatement. <laughs> Personally, I just love his songs. Rich in melody and beautifully crafted, there's something uniquely warm about Clive's music. Draws you in and flows over you, leaving you wanting more. You can follow Clive and his current projects by downloading his own personal iOS app. I think it's just an iOS app, but it may be others. I recommend joining up. His recent tour monologues are worth the reading themselves. Very funny and a real eye-opener to touring for today's modern musician. My ultimate piece of music and therefore recommendation from Clive's repertoire is his instrumental from Arena's album Contagion called Riding the Tide. Mm. The whole album is superb of course and based on a short story written by Clive but for me this track just stands out. Sure. Well Clive Nolan, well certainly he has been a very prominent figure in the development of prog rock um, and it has been a long-standing member of Pendragon as you indicated. Shadowland and Arena. Um, and he has a, well, such a diverse and successful output um, with a multitude of projects and other bands uh, during his long standing career. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's a great choice. A very busy boy. Yeah. So, your number two? Okay, my number two, maybe no surprise, <laughs> Tony Banks, okay, from Genesis. Now, as I'm sure we all know, he plays keyboards and is um, one of the main songwriters and lyricists uh, for the band. And I consider the prog rock era of the band, Genesis, to run from 1971 with Nursery Crime to 1976 with Wind and Wuthering. And so where do you see, um, and then there were three sin? It's not prog. You reckon it's not prog? Really? I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, so, although technically proficient, he doesn't possess the blistering technical ability that Emerson had, for example. But I believe that Banks' keyboard work creates a superb, melodic, emotional and spiritual peak which really lifts the listener to a higher place. Um, he is a major part of the Genesis sound. So think of the beautiful piano introduction to Firth of Fifth the instrumental sections of the cinema show, and Sapper's Ready, um, and I love the Apocalypse in 9-8 mm. uh, section, which he plays the solo in 4-4 four, four over the 9-8 mm. rhythm section, yeah. and the, beautifully, uh, the beautiful chord progression and sonic texture of Afterglow, for example, mm. which showcases the upfront, characteristic, big symphonic Genesis sound. For me, the best Genesis album is probably also Selling England. Um, so that could be the band at their peak. Mm -hmm. Banks is known for using instruments like Hammond organs, uh, mellotrons, uh, pianos and synthesizers, beginning with a, a monophonic ARP pro soloist, then a polymoog, an early polyphonic synthesizer, before moving on to the very well-known sound of sequential circuits mm. instruments. As technology advanced even further, he bought newer units such as a EMU, Emulator 2 Plus, a digital sampler, um, a Synclavia 2, and various Roland and Korg synthesizers. Mm. Yeah, obviously, I, he was my uh, earlier, one of my earlier picks, and I, I just love mm. Tony Banks, so yeah. not much more to say about that. Sure. So my number two. Okay. I, like many others, yep. discovered Rick Wakeman through the music of oh. Yes. I received tales from Topographic Oceans and my first all-in-one stereo music centre as a Christmas present in 1974. This was a gift from my parents that I and them would never forget. 
I, because it was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with music, and them for the ensuing repeated phrase, will you please turn that racket down? So was that the last record your parents gave you? It, <laughs> it sounds like the Christmas from hell. It wasn't. I would consistently repeat side one of Tales so I can imagine that's why they were shouting, and in particular, the keyboard solo at the end of the track. I was pretend playing every note on whatever hard surface was close by. I of course then made it my life school to own every piece of Yes and Rick's solo work that I could lay my hands on. I drank it all in. The brilliance of Close to the Edge, the genius of the Royal College of Music students, Six Wives and the Journey to mm. the Centre of the Earth. Yeah. The beauty of the melodic Catherine Howard to the sublime brilliance that was going for the one. Yeah. I was fortunate to see the yeah. Going for the One Yes tour mm. in Glasgow, queuing up overnight for tickets in freezing weather with friends. What a show. It was life changing. Impeccably performed with Rick in full cloak and culminating in a meeting with the band afterwards where they chatted and signed my tour program. Still one of my all time treasures. Stories around the ever colourful Rick are many. He once formed a band called Curdled Milk, a wordplay joke on the band Cream. He, he did this to play the annual school dance. The band ended up unpaid as Rick lost control of his car and drove right through the headmaster's rose garden and had to forfeit their performance fee to pay for the damage. In July 1970, Wakeman organised a folk night called The Booze Drop. It failed to make any impact and to help him out, his mate, David Bowie, oh, yeah. agreed to play an acoustic set for five quid to help him raise funds. The gig was very poorly advertised and was a total disaster, with a total of 12 people attending. If you were one of those 12, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> he also has the distinction of pushing Salvador Dali off the stage when he made a special guest appearance during one of Wakeman's piano solos. Apparently Rick didn't know who he was and thought he was just some silly old sod invading the stage. <laughs> His skill at sessions was outstanding though and it was here he earned the nickname One Take Wakeman. That's right. His vast music catalogue just speaks for itself. In fact, we met the great man yeah, we did. together yep. at a local club venue yep. here in Melbourne for the Silent mm. Nights tour. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, Rick Wakeman... Um, well, I mean, what, what a legend. Uh, and I remember thinking this guy has actually hung around to speak with us, uh, you know, the fans after that show. Um, that was really impressive. I vaguely remember I upset him. I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> anyway, you were surprised well, at that, well, though. One of any. <laughs> okay, all right, at number one. Now, I haven't mentioned him yet. Go on. So you have probably guessed that at number one... <laughs> I have Rick Wakeman, your number two. So I'm going to try and not repeat some of, the, some of your comments, Liz. Um, so most of us probably know that Rick Wakeman intended to be a concert pianist, but in the late 1960s decided to become a full-time session musician working with the likes of David Bowie, Elton John, Cat Stevens. Remember the piano on Morning is Broken? Um, now, in early 1971, Steve Howe and Chris Squire from Yes saw the Straubs with Wakeman using a Mellotron and a Mini Moog synthesizer, giving vivid orchestral and choral textures to the music. Howe and Squire then asked Tony Kay, who played organ exclusively <laughs> with Yes, to bring these on board, but he declined. And shortly afterwards, tensions rose within the band, and for some unknown reason, mm. uh, just minutes later, uh, Tony <laughs> Kay left. I got sacked. Yeah, yeah po possibly. <laughs> so Wakeman moved from his folk rock band, The Straubs, to Yes. Mm. So the stage outfits he sometimes wore suggested that he was a magician or wizard with his fingers. And to be honest, I probably don't rate him as being as technically proficient okay. or a pre precise a player as Keith Emerson, but I'm, I'm talking about Emerson again. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the orchestral soundscapes Wakeman created on Close to the Edge, for example, are just phenomenal. Uh, you know, have a listen to And You and I to appreciate his magnificence. 
he was able to create great melodies. Mm. His style is fluent and draws upon a love of many genres, all unified and brought into proper focus. He was such a big influence in making Yes one of the standout prog rock acts of the 1970s. Wakeman also had an extensive solo career, beginning in 1973 with the smash release, Six The Six Wives of Henry VIII. So a personal highlight for me with Yes is Awaken, which showcases Wakeman's technical playing, lavish soundscapes and arrangements to make it one of the most thrilling mm. and accomplished performances in the genre, full stop. Mm. Incidentally, this song was recorded in 1977 at the height of punk, and <laughs> I respect Yes um, at this time for going with their gut feelings and just continuing to deliver that classic prog rock sound that we still all love today. Mm -hmm. I remember reading an interview in Melody Maker, I think it was with John Anderson just before um, going for the one came yeah. out. Okay. And it was at that point where I think the interviewer said something like, you know, how do you feel about punk? And he said, what's punk? And I think that kind of put in perspective where yes, were at that point in time, you know, it was focused. just, yeah, they were just focused. Yeah. So then we get to my number one, yeah. and it's probably no surprise after some of the things I've said before. Right. But I first came across Keith Emerson when right. I was 14 years old. Yeah. My musical tastes back then were more rock focused, and I was enjoying the likes of Deep Purple, Status Quo, Early Queen, to name a few. Prog hadn't quite reached my radar at this point until a close family friend offered to lend me a copy of ELP's live album and trilogy album. When I first put the needle to vinyl, I thought I had been led into some sort of elaborate practical joke. When the initial sound of a heartbeat started, and then an erratic and frantic eclectic piano made its way out of my parents' old stereo. I thought, what's this? <laughs> then the drums kicked in, and Greg Lake's beautiful vocal hit front mm. and centre. Yeah. The playing was exquisite. The classical yeah. rock melodies were to die for. Mm. Nothing followed a standard structure. Mm. It was not only interesting, it was sonically beautiful. Mm. It was three people playing, but it sounded so rich, yeah. so different. Yeah. The multitude of exciting new keyboard sounds especially stood out. Mm. Hoedown was just so rich with synth sounds, and Trilogy itself was to me best described as a musical novel. Mm. After that, I couldn't get enough. My Emerson progress, of course, was hampered by the fact that I was 14, with no real attainable income. I was reliant on birthday presents from before <laughs> yeah, okay. and Christmas presents to grow my collection. Mm -hmm. When I finally got my hands on my own copy of Brain Salad Surgery, yeah. I knew I was listening to something really, really special. It was an unforgettable moment of my musical youth, mm. and from then on in, I couldn't get enough of prog of all sorts. Yeah. Emerson, of course, was the great Moog pioneer, as mm. Tom said before. Mm. The first person to tour with the Moog Modular, that great impressive juggernaut of wires and keys that was to shape the ELP sound. It looked demonic on stage. Who the hell knew what was going on, but in truth, Emerson shaped contemporary perception of the synth as a performance instrument, and boy could he play. He basically paved the way for a new genre of music that endears and fascinates to this very day. His contribution to the world of progressive rock, in my mind, is unfathomable, and I, for one, am eternally grateful. Sure. Uh, well, Keith Emerson, certainly mm. an amazing and revolutionary player. He was, without doubt, incredible. I, I suppose the reason I picked uh, Banks and Wakeman over Emerson was not because they were better players, but mm. I just preferred the symphonic the big symphonic sounds, which the mood couldn't couldn't do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's it. These are our top five prog rock keyboard player picks. How did we go? Did we miss your favourite prog rock keyboard player? If you like the content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and ring the bell. So thank you and see you next time. See you next time.